as filmmakers we need to kind of keep evolving and keep finding new ways to do that and that will not happen if you keep saying the stories the same way this new breed of actors from prithvi to fahad tulka nivin all of them are working with only new new filmmakers people love watching monlal do this larger than life character hi bujaj welcome to film companion hello you're a malayali from mumbai you're kind of part insider part outsider to malayalam cinema so i wanted to ask your viewpoint in why is everybody talking about malayalam cinema today i mean suddenly everybody is talking about fahad fasal everybody is mm-hmm. talking about mahesh inda pratikaram mm-hmm. what is it i think um, uh, even earlier on uh, people used to talk a lot about malayalam films uh, then there was this one lull that happened and uh, i think it was in the maybe the 90s and the early 2000s where uh, nobody was talking about malayalam cinema even malayalis were not talking about malayalam cinema so that was that time then this fresh infusion happened of of really um, a lot of young filmmakers this new breed of actors from prithvi to fahad tulka nivin asif ali a lot of a lot of these guys yeah. got together and and they started uh, they started following the same format of what you know the earlier actors they all of them start, started doing like three four films one go you know uh, they were not being you know that choosy anything but but what they also did was they also enabled a lot of young filmmakers they were not just working with the old timers in fact all of them are working with only new new filmmakers so then that brought about a lot of change so uh, then some i think uh, the last couple of years some terrific content started being made and and these guys were championing that that kind of films now what has happened is now this is another phase happening where all these actors are now have their own production houses and producing films because they really seen the value in that they really seen the value in being part of interesting films and not just um, earlier in fact i, I used to say uh, uh, it was like tamil where there there was a good balance you had your typical hero films uh, uh, like typical ma- maasi films and then this middle of the road and interesting cinema being made but now the 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 balance is completely shifted now now you have only i would say nine films are like this really interesting new ideas being tackled right. and maybe one masi film comes out maybe in 2 3 months this one comes out so that balance is completely shifted so that's why a lot of and of course uh, uh, with the digital uh, advent and so many platforms and social media there's a lot of conversation that is also uh, people who nestle don't watch south indian films because now some films are being talked about so much they end up sampling and watching it and everything and that that has led to a lot of people who are talking about malayalam cinema but is it is it just like one small bunch of cinephiles or do you see this malayalam cinema this new malayalam cinema has having made inroads into quite a like a wider path you had ari aster talk about lijo's film so right. i don't think it's a bunch of cinephiles, cinephiles anymore right right <laughs> maybe that was the case maybe say 3 4 years ago right but so it was just like a close bunch of people close bunch of people talking about it and i would say maximum like the the, the tamil audience or the tamil people also spoke about it right. and, you know so the south industry was maybe talking about it but now it's i think gone pan indian now i think now you have a massive audience you know, who who are sampling this who are watching this who are talking about it and who are waiting who are waiting right. to see what next from this filmmaker and that's very interesting to see that they are not just uh, uh, like they know a certain filmmaker's filmography now right which was not the case before yeah so that's very interesting so i want to ask you one thing about the malayali male psyche let's take nyan prakashan right fahad plays this very very non macho kind of leading man who was a very normal person and the person you would run into in real life it's actually the macho guys that you don't run into like on a regular he plays a very normal human being now in tamil and telugu cinema now this kind of a leading man actors you would be very hesitant about playing because yeah. they will say there is no heroism in the character so what makes this new breed of malayalam heroes say i'm not interested in being this larger than life star i just want to play very human and humane characters i mean is it just like they like these kind of roles or is it also like something in the culture itself that that doesn't value machoism when the teaser came out and prakashan teaser i remember i uh, was sitting with my whole family there was like some 20 people that we were having this big family dinner 
and the, uh, we were playing YouTube and watching something on YouTube and uh, uh, this teaser came out. I remember the reaction the whole family had, how, how they watched the teaser. In the, if I remember correctly, in the teaser, uh, Fahad goes to this wedding and uh, uh, he goes to the wedding and he's just waiting to go to have the, uh, the sadhya. And at the Sadhya, you can see him uh, eating like, you know, and then suddenly the video camera comes and he just stops and <laughs> everybody just were like on the floor laughing. They could all relate to him. They could all, and like you said, it's that culture of, you know, we know this man, we know this guy. And yet they want to go see something like that. Uh, and I, I think the whole relatability factor is what makes uh, the Malayalam audience rever such characters. Um, which is why the films we love and we talk about so much in Malayalam uh, from the 80s and the 90s have all been films with uh, and with superstars. Huh? With, I'm talking about Mohanlal, yeah, yeah. Mamuti, and all. The, but them playing these real, real characters, you know. So and and I, those are the characters that those are the films that people love. Those are the films that uh, uh, um, the audiences still we like rewatch so many times and. Now when that kind of renaissance is happening and we are seeing the similar stories being told with main leads doing very humane characters, I think there is suddenly this newfound love for it all over again. So it's, it's Malayalam audience kind of falling in love with the same stories all over again. So how That's do you how explain the mega success of something like Lucifer? Like I said, there is, we, are, we are still trying to strike that balance. So, and even Lucifer is kind of a throwback to Ravana Prabhu and to Deva Suraman, to right. the kind of characters. So we did have those. It's not like that was not there. Right. But uh, so I think Prithvi felt that this is just taking over. Let me give an answer, say, let me do this and show that <laughs> even this is still relevant. And I think the success of Lucifer showed that too. And people loved watching Mohanlal do this larger than life character. And, and um, I think that balance is still there. Right. Now, you find people accepting Mohanlal and Mamoti to an extent, like doing the Fahad kind of role. Uh, but do you think the reverse is possible? Do you think like this generation? For sure, for sure. Uh, it's not been done yet, but for sure. Right. Prithvi, I think, is one of those guys who's tried it. Tried it. And even yeah. Nivin did Kayangulam. Uh, yeah, yeah, Nivin, which yeah. also met with a lot of success. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. But it all depends on the subject and, and on how it is packaged and promoted and all that. Right. But yeah, for right. sure. Right. In fact, Kayangulam Kuchan is a great example. It, it did, uh, there was a huge excitement for it and people lapped it up. So you keep track of the numbers and things like that? Yeah, yeah I do. I do. Okay. Though Malayalam industry, it's very difficult to keep track of numbers, but uh, I try and keep track of numbers. Okay. So when you met Solo, right? Yeah. What made you think, I want to make this in Malayalam and Tamil? And because one, one would have naturally thought something, you know, this different Right. Like an anthology, whatever would would actually Hindi might be the first place you do it. Also because your earlier films were in uh, Hindi. Hindi. Yeah. Actually, Hindi. I'm sure even now if I go pitch this, I'm not gonna get people to uh, bite on it. Anthologies was like a no no because okay. they have Hindi immediate the references. They they come back with a reference saying that look this has not worked. This has not worked. Why should this work? Uh, Malayalam also uh, had references, but uh, thankfully. Someone like Dulkar still saw potential and still saw something new that we could try in it. And uh, his, it was his idea to try and do it in Tamil also because he was trying to explore the Tamil market also. And I also thought that th this is quite relevant and it can work in the Tamil market if, if, if we pitch it correctly and if we do it correctly. So, uh, Solo, I, I didn't even try to do it in Hindi. Okay, okay. It was always conceived as a Malayalam film and my own, only thing with that was that when I'm doing my first Malayalam film, I want to try and do something radically different, which has not been radically right. done before. And that too, with someone like Dulkar backing it, I thought it was a great fit for me to start with. So, Dulkar was on with that anthology idea. He yeah, won. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Okay, okay. So, do you see Solo as being part of this new gen Malayalam tradition? I hope so. I hope so. It, uh, see, uh, see, it didn't meet with the kind of success, for sure, the other films have. But I hope it's been taken in the same uh, vein as the other films also. Right. I, I'm, because I'm part of that gen. and. Uh, uh, so, I, I hope when they talk about the kind of films that, uh, that are being done now, Solo becomes, you know, it's, it's counted as one of them, I just hope so. Because I, I, Dilkar told me this also, that it will find its love, you know, don't worry. And, and it has, you know, there's so many people who still talk about it and like it and all that, so, which is great, it's very heartening to see. But 
at the end of the day you know it needs to deliver it needs to have those numbers for it to you know be called a success for sure it's a it's also that that one of the interesting things that happened around solo was that see a lot of them have successes and a lot of them right. have failures but somehow dulkar took this very personally yeah and uh, there was that whole twitter reaction and things like that do you think that because they they want they are also fostering a kind of film culture these films become more personal to them or is it just like you guys didn't get it so i'm going to offer this counter no no i think the kind of person he is he, he, uh, he he's a very sensitive guy and and uh, very mindful of who he is where he comes from and all that but it still doesn't stop him from you know talking about it he might kill me for saying this but uh, um, he was one of the first guys who used to talk to the press a lot from the because malayalam has this thing that actors don't talk to press so weirdly they don't uh, uh, have those interviews and they don't do that but he was one of the first guys who did that but when he saw that something that he said was being miscommunicated then he said you know what i'm not going to do this uh, i'm going to stop it from now on i'm not going to talk to the uh, i'll let me follow what others are doing and i'll do the same thing you know then that becomes a disconnect also you know for uh, so then when he really wants to say something and everything he uh, luckily we have other platforms available right now so when something like this happened i guess he just couldn't bear it and anyway. he just wanted to put his point out and he wanted to put his what he thought about the film because uh, there were a lot of stories being told at that time and a lot of miscommunication being spread so he wanted to make sure to, that he that he backs the film and he really believes in it and he wanted that to be known so i think that's why he he felt that felt the need to talk about it and we were like just fighting too many battles because it was not just we were fighting this battle with the malayalam producer and tamil we were fighting another battle with the theater strike so it was just too many things piled up against us that we were trying to battle at that time looking back do you think something like solo might have worked better on a streaming platform for sure i think uh, it would have found a, uh, i mean it would have found its audience it, it's right now it's streaming on netflix but uh, maybe it would have been a better fit for sure so when uh, this is a question i have about act- directors of your generation who have consumed a lot of indian cinema but who have also consumed a lot of western cinema so your sensibilities are kind of like midway i would say yeah so you're not exactly what they call mass mm-hmm. filmmakers but at the same time you know you're not art film makers Maker, either yeah. there's a there's a mainstream niche that you guys have uh, a bunch of you so would streaming be an automatic way of saying i have the subject streaming works for me or are we still at an era where people say no 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 my film has to be in theaters first and you know i have to be theatrically recognized by people uh, you know that is something is that something i should still be viable as a person who's movies out in the mo- in the theaters first it's a bit of a f- in a state of flux right now um, because both conversations are happening and i am part of those conversations so what I is both conversations which is that i want to have my films theatrically uh, released to be relevant enough but at the same time this seems like a good fit they are in fact paying me better they they are they're going to showcase my film better so maybe this is a right so with the streaming platforms gaining so much momentum in the last couple of years uh, there has been that want there has been that desire to be part of all that but uh, film wise i think it's just starting off last what one year two years where originals are taking yeah, precedence yeah. and yeah. so i think the next couple of years will be very critical for filmmakers like me who will maybe find a you know a very comfortable space with those platforms and just stick there or we will try and find a balance uh, like something like that happened with the irishman is great if we can get that idea but martin scorsese can ask for it i don't think we, we are there yet um, so i think it'll the next couple of years will be a very defining time for filmmakers like uh, because you're very right i i don't fit into that massy thing and i think i'll be a t- i'll do a terrible job if i try to do that also but at the same time the kind of stories i want to say if i find a better fit with the platforms then maybe i'll go that way but then um and there they don't care about the star system they don't so right. it gives you that also that liberty of that you can go work with who you want and the stories take more prominence uh, so when you look at something like solo today and again i come back because that's your most unusual film would you have done it a little differently had you made it directly for a streaming platform in other words i'm what i'm asking is are there things in shaitan or david or solo or wazir that you've done thinking that you know what i need to do this add this one bit for because it's going to make the movie a little more saleable uh, theatrically barring 
Vazir, I think all of the films, I have not done anything, in, like I have not uh, compromised on any level. I have issues with Solo with one aspect of the story of it. Otherwise, I'm very happy with the way the film was. I'm one of those weird filmmakers, I like my own films a lot. <laughs> so I like the way it was done. Uh, I didn't have to change or do anything. I had people who really believed in it and backed it the way they, uh, right. backed my vision on the, on the films. Uh, be it Shaitan, be with Anurag, who just didn't bother, who, who just told me, this is what you want to make? Let's go with that only. Right. He, he, I remember him watching the first cut and I was so petrified that he'll gonna come and be the, because he's a, he's a director producer who's gonna come and you know, he's yeah. come with his own thing. But he was very clear that this, it should just go the way it was. You don't need to change anything. Right. And that's my first film. So when you start off from the first film like that, then you want every film to be like that. Yeah. So luckily I didn't have to do that at all. What happened to Vazir then? Vazir was a, <laughs> in hindsight, Vazir was a uh, difficult uh, beast because um, it was a story uh, uh, that Mr. Chopra had written almost 30, 35 years ago. So and the fact that he held on to it means it's it's so dear to him and he worked on it for so long. He worked on the, the he was going to make it into a Hollywood film. So he had made it like a proper draft and he had he really uh, held on it for many years. So for him to let go of that was itself a task. He offered it to me. He said that you should do this. and. Uh, then he was part of the writing and the writing to adapt that into Hindi took about one and a half years. Me with my set of writers with him and Abhijad, we sat and wrote. But I remember after writing and everything, um, uh, when we had the cast, everything was in place and we knew we were going to shoot in this, this time. And uh, uh, the one thing I had told him right before we started work also, I said that, sir, uh, once you sign off on the script, then I'll have to take onus of it and I'll make it the way I want to make it. And you can't come to my set. I told him that, you can't come to my set. And he said, of course, I will not come. No. And, and then he told me a story of how he went to one set in, uh, of Raju Rani's film and uh, one of the actors came and asked him, said, how was the shot? And he decided from that day that he'll never go to the set. Yeah. So it was very sweet, he told me the story. And so when we were about to make the film and uh, uh, about three days before the shoot, he said that, yeah, I think I'm gonna come to set. I said, no sir, that's a deal we had, you can't come to set. He said, no, I changed my mind. Uh, I'm not, uh, I, I know you'll do it well, but I still wanna be there. I wanna be there when you do it. Let me come. And I said, no, that's a deal breaker. <laughs> three days before the show, that's it, you can't come. He threw an angry fit. He said, okay, fine, cancel the shoot. Cancel it, cancel, cancel. He said, just cancel the whole thing. And I was like, really? Are you really doing this? And he canceled it. He said, cancel. And I said, no, but the dates are all done. He said, no, no, cancel. So I said, okay, fine. So I also stood my ground. I said, okay, cancel, cancel. Then later on in the evening, he gives me a call. Calls me back. And he's sitting with uh, Raju and Abhijat and everything. He said, you have to understand. And that's when he told me, 35 years I've had this. <laughs> So I know we have worked, I know you've seen, and you, I know you told me what you're gonna do in this shot, and you know, told me everything, but it's still difficult for me to give my baby to you. So you better do a good job with it. And he gave it to me and he said that, I'm not coming, don't worry. But you need to send me rushes every day. Every day you send me rushes. I said, that's not a problem. In fact, I, I said, I'll do one better. I'll send you a lineup. I won't just send you rushes, I'll cut a small uh, sequence and I'll send you so that you know how it's going. And I said, he said, he was very happy, like, that's great. <laughs> So then, that was the beginning of our, I think, uh, uh, the journey together with this Chopra. So I feel uh, as much as it is my film, I, I, and he was and he was man of his word. He never came to my set, never. But in editing, he killed me. He killed me in the edit. <laughs> but it was a journey that I took with him. So uh, I, I, I really want to. Um, I learned a lot from that film. It, I think it's the longest period that I spent on a film. It was three years of my life that I spent on Wazir. Um, if you ask me uh, whether I'm fully satisfied with it, as compared to Shaitan and David and uh, Solano, uh, I'm not because uh, I did see the film a certain way. And finally, the way it came out, I was, I think it, about 80% is what I really wanted. But that 20% uh, is not something that I do regret. But at the same time, it, that regret comes with a lot of um, uh, love for the fact that it was someone's vision. So I had to justify that vision. I had to do the best I could do, and I did. But uh, it was almost like a marriage. So um, 
I enjoyed that process a lot. I learned a lot. He's one of a kind, and I'm sure you you hear all the crazy stories about him. That's not just true. That's absolutely true, <laughs> and, and there are more. But one thing you can't take away from that guy is that he, the the, and this is from the first meeting I had with him. Uh, I remember the first meeting that I had. The passion that he has for films and for filmmaking. It is so like he can just own the room and he can just talk about films with so much love and passion that I, I've not seen that energy in even like the youngest of filmmakers or the aspiring filmmakers. You 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 can't just take that away from him and that's so infectious and you want to be around that kind of energy and that I think one of the reasons I wanted to work with him was that because I just wanted to pick his brain to see uh, what he did with his films and um, it was a great journey. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Is that why you keep working, going back to Maniratnam as well? For sure. I mean, like that passion, picking his brains, all that you mentioned with Vinod Chopra. It's a different school, but exactly the same reason. Uh, one thing I, I keep discussing with fellow filmmakers is that once we have become directors, it's like we have um, that onus is on us now, we have to keep making films. But there's no downtime for us to go back to just learning. You know, it's like we just learn on the job now. Uh, we learn, uh, and of course, it's, every film is a learning for that way. But for us to just um, go back to the basics, like I have not had formal training in any filmmaking. I have not studied film. Right. In fact, I keep telling Manisha also that, that I want to go back to like FTI and just do a film appreciation course. It will really help. For me personally, that the reason I go back to him is that because I get to learn a lot. For me, it's like going back to just doing a crash course in filmmaking. And and every film that I've worked with him, it's been that. I've, I've, it's been such a massive learning experience because when I go to him, I sit with him, I sit and read his script that he's doing. As a director, I'm thinking, okay, this is the way he's going right. to be doing. And I'm not even saying nine out of ten times. Ten out of ten times, it's never like that. It's n like one scene that I read and I think that this is the way he'll do it. It's never the way, you know, it's, it's never been that that's the way he's tackled it. So that itself is a learning that how he tackles the scene, how he stages it with his actors, how his technicians come on board and how they come and you know elevate that particular thing. So just being there observing is a huge, huge learning. And I, I look forward to that every time. In fact, I keep checking with his schedules all the time just so that whenever I'm done, I can go back and try and work with him. And it's, uh, I actually tried to do that with some other filmmakers. I actually reached out to some filmmakers that I really like. Right. I, I, that, I, that was what I was going to ask you because you know you already know the way Maniratnam works. Right. So wouldn't it be helpful to go and work with yes, like for somebody sure. else? For sure. Yeah. But they don't take me seriously. I, I spoke to Dibakar. I said I would love to just come work with you. He doesn't take me seriously. <laughs> and and the, let this be a plan. Let me tell you know I really want to work with Dibakar. I want to work with so many other filmmakers. I would love to work with Zoya. I would love to work with people just to kind of understand their process, how they right. how they conceive, how they write, how they stage. So, uh, as filmmakers, I think it is important for us to kind of just learn from each other that way. I, I, it'll only, I know for a fact that it'll only enrich me. That I'm, when I'm doing that, I'll, I'll take all that and I'll try and apply, and try, or if not apply, at least get something out of that, you know, for sure. So, can you give an example of a scene? You just, one of the interesting things that you said was 10 out of 10 times. The way I look at a scene is not the way Maniratnam tackles a scene. Right. Can you give an example of like a scene that from whichever film that you worked with that oh <laughs> and I'm sure there are many but there are many just to kind of bring a concrete example. Carter, I think there are two scenes which I, I remember very clearly being on set with him and uh, read the script and know the scene. Uh, one scene is of uh, Aditi coming in telling Karthi that she's pregnant and then they're both lying on the bed and talking. And uh, I remember the way he staged it and uh, the pregnancy news itself was very nicely done. Uh, it was initially, there was there were dialogues in it, there were one or two dialogues in it that he comes and talks to her. But then the whole thing was done in silence. Right. Where he, she, she comes in and he, there was a moment where um, uh, he, he drags her towards the bed and she drags him away. That was not there in the script. That was that happened on the staging. He himself found it damn funny. Uh, Manisha found it damn funny when when Karthi did it, and he said, "Let's keep it. It's very nice." He goes to the bed and he pulls him. Uh, she pulls him to the mirror, and that whole thing happens in silence. 
and you can change see the change in expression in Karthi's face right which is kind of a prelude to the next scene you are setting it up for the next scene yeah which is not there on paper when when you uh, when I was when you read the scene she gives the news and next thing they are on the bed and they are talking to each other and you see um, and uh, when you read it on paper when you read the scene and it's her and him talking and, and you imagine it a certain way so your a dialogue scene becomes a silent scene that happened with the earlier one dialogue scene became a silent scene and the next scene the next scene is the one which I which really blew me away when I saw the way it was staged because um it's a very uh, i mean it's one of the most important things in the film where, where she is kind of trying she's trying to see whether what will happen if i tell him this really it's almost like a decision maker for her right. in, in that sense and um so uh, being on sir set and I, I it's almost half scheduled and what happens is the thing is when when you we all become like first ladies your your thinking start or uh, as much as as creative you want to be you get the logistics also quickly into the thing because you're thinking okay you need about 2 3 hours to finish this we need to move to the next setup so i can maybe get ravi verman's associate to start lighting up that so you're thinking of all that when you're about to staging the scene so you you're doing all that when uh, so i in my head i'm thinking okay this will be this shot this shot this shot and that's it no, no maybe he'll take another insert over there and and then he set up the shot on top right and he just started he did that whole trucking in down to them and it just goes closer 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 there. and not once did i even in all the logistic planning not even once did i think that this could be staged this way where these two people are just like that and and uh, she's not even fa- facing him and he's facing the other way and the whole dynamics of that scene changed the way he staged it and you finally see the output you feel like there's no better way to do it like any any other way would have been so much more like it wouldn't have been this impactful and that again uh, that's not something you can you know you can learn from it but it definitely opens you up in terms of uh, you you when you read a scene you start to limit yourself thinking because it's a preset that plays right and he always fights those presets and that's one thing i've always taken away from him and i really really um, that scene was like an eye opener for me when i saw it being staged and staged so beautifully and the scene just kind of flew for me when when i saw that and that happens a lot actually with him what made you say that this is the best way to stage a scene because what is the emotional thing that you get from that when you're watching it being staged that way because the emotion is still there when right. she's telling him and he is like no i don't want this baby because it will turn out to be like me and you know at first he want he kind of he kind of thing and then he yeah, says you know yeah, yeah, these two yeah. yeah because i you know this is not me so that's still there in the in the dialogue right right so when that's you as a director dialogue. when you as a director when you're seeing this the staging happening what is playing in your mind i'm so used to certain presets because you when you read something on when you read a scene you are coming with all the kind of films i've seen before and you know like how padmarajan used to stage his scenes his love scenes and this kind of dramas and this kind of setups so it's somewhere subliminally it's, it's playing in your head that it, this is the way it should be staged but then when it's almost like lateral thinking then you see that oh no there's a completely different way to look at it there's a completely different way and within that way you're saying the scene emotionally it's connecting with you but it's also doing x y the three other things along with it like for example that that shot she's facing another way he's facing another way and they both are giving their points of view so you're constantly flipping between the two of them and at the same time it's tracking down is going closer to them so it's 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 emotionally engaging in multiple ways and not just one way not just this one straight forward way so as a filmmaker that's some like that's like a learning for me and that's a simple scene i mean on paper it's a simple scene so which means that those kind of things can be done for other things also so uh, it it kind of opens you up and makes you want to think uh, differently for some things which you want to like you know it, it influences the way you write yourself and want to stage also but are you the kind of director who can do this in the sense that like some people like pre planning right this sounds like something that you would do on the set right so what what kind of director are you because, i mean would you because this also takes time right because right. it's you're like you're not you're kind of if you're going to go there and say uh, let me think of the best way to do this right. that's also going to like you know sometimes maybe it'll affect your schedule or whatever of course of yeah. course of course and um i know for a fact that manisha used to sit and design a lot of stuff before he at least had a clear idea of when he like how he wants to stage and of course then once he goes on set he'll try and tweak it and 
if something magical happens, then he'll push for that. And weirdly, those are the practices because I only worked with him. So those are the practices that we've also followed. But off late, I think my new film, this one that I'm, I've done right now, has been a very different working experience for me because um, uh, I worked with a very, very young team. Uh, or DOP first feature, production designer first feature, uh, my, my editor first feature. So I was working with a new team because uh, um, for various reasons. I, I wanted to try and push and try and work with this, uh, new, this new people, new, new people and trying to infuse some new blood into my process and it did because I used to follow a certain pattern of uh, uh, staging and film making and all that. I believed in prep but not to the extent of like you know knowing exactly what I want, how I want it, uh, communicating it to the whole team, everybody knows everything kind of thing. I don't believe in that I, because I, I kind of let it open and I want my technicians, want my actors to also collaborate. Right. But this particular film that I just did, I consciously wanted to change something like that. I, I don't think I changed fully, but uh, I would definitely say about 50-60% of the way I usually do, is I could change it mainly because of this new crew that came on board, who believed fully in like they wanted to prep everything. And I said, let me try that. Let me for a change. Let me try that. And I, I got to learn a lot from them. I, I, it was a good learning experience for me. And weirdly, this this actors also that I worked with, um, Jim, Pulkit, uh, Harsh, they're also actors I've not really worked with before. Jim I've worked with before. The others haven't. So we again with them also there was like a lot of prep we ma managed to do which again i think for me was a good i always usually workshop with my actors but we just just didn't do workshop we did something else we did something more for it we, we worked a lot on each scene we spoke a lot about the scenes we changed some of the uh, writing the scenes from the feedback that we got from the actors and all, which i actually don't do much but i did that because i saw merit in it i, I really genuinely thought not for the sake of just changing, but I genuinely saw that, that this is helping. And uh, hopefully that will translate well and uh, I'll get to finally, the final product will say everything. But it was, a, for me as a filmmaker, it was an interesting experience. It was in a way addictive also because you can see the, um, when you see the result, you finally see, okay, yeah, that did make sense to do it like that. So maybe I might adopt uh, for future also for sure. But uh, this is what I meant that earlier when I said that as filmmakers we need to kind of keep evolving and keep finding new ways to do that and, and that will not happen if you keep seeing the same stories or keep saying the stories the same way. Right. Is this going to be a, more of a personal journey than something that, that will work for an audience? I think as a filmmaker, um, personally for me, that is way more important. Uh, I'm definitely making films with audiences in mind. Right. So, that's ingrained when I'm writing. When yeah. Writing. But that uh, I've, I've, I've realized in the last couple of years is that that personal journey is way, way, way more, more important. And that push will always be for that first. Though how much of that will help me be relevant, I'm not sure. Right. But that push is definitely going to be due towards that. Yeah, because we're in this really interesting time right now where on the one hand you're seeing a lot of really innovative films being made. But then there is also a lot of old-timey kind of stuff working well at the box right. office. So it's not like people are just saying, oh, this fabulous filmmaker has made this wonderful staging and all this kind of film, so let's go. You know, it's yeah. still, you know, that's, that's so that there's still that push-pull happening like that. Because whereas when you look at streaming, there's a lot more, a lot more risks, uh, being risks being taken and a lot more stylistic, you know, uh, uh, content being put out. Like stylistic as in not just stylish, but this certain vision, you know, yeah. those things are stronger, like like on the, on the streaming platforms, which kind of brings me back to my old question: when you when you want to make films, uh, you know, it, it could go either way, I guess, these days, and which is what will make things interesting for the next couple of years, as exactly. you say. Exactly, next couple of years will be very critical, like for, especially for filmmakers like me and all who who struggle to find that balance. <laughs> right, right. Thanks so much, Vijay. Thanks for your content. Thank you yeah, so much. Thanks. Yeah.